Hello, I wanted to talk about fever very quickly. This is something that is going to differentiate between homeostatic states of temperature and in inflammatory response. So to start out with, um, I would like you to understand the hypothalamic control of body temperature, um, how the body deals with variations from homeostasis in things like hyperthermia and hypothermia. And in those ways of dealing with it, you'll see compensatory mechanisms. So we'll go over those. And then we'll end with fever production. So the mechanism of which, and then just briefly contrasting fever and hyperthermia. Um, and we'll end with inflammation and targeting anti-inflammatory modalities. That being said, we have a normal thermoregulatory um, strategy in the body, whereby the hypothalamus, which sets a lot of the different homeostatic um, measures in the body, like respiratory rate, um, cardiothoracic types of rhythms, all of these baseline things, including your sleep, your caloric intake, so your basal metabolic rate, all of these are controlled by the hypothalamus, including thermoregulation or temperature regulation. So normal temperature is different for everybody. Um, we consider normal to be about 37 degrees Celsius or 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's something that is an average of the population. Everyone's resting basal, basal means baseline. Um, basal body temperature is a little bit different. So the populations averaged together will give you these readings of 37 Celsius or 98 Fahrenheit. Also, the temperature changes throughout different cycles. So first off, we have the circadian rhythm. And circadian, that circa means about or around, and dian is day. So it's about a day. That's your 24-hour cycle. And what you see is temperature is correlated with energy expenditure. So when you're sleeping, for example, if we're looking at temperature as a line, your temperature is pretty low. And then as soon as you get up in the morning and you start burning more calories, your temperature is going to go up for the day. It might stay raised. It might go up a little higher if you exercise, like maybe here's a run. And then when you go back to sleep again, it goes down. In females with the menstrual cycle, so that's about a monthly cycle, generally 28 to 32 days, uh, females have an interesting uh, temperature change in that their basal temperature stays stable until ovulation occurs. And once there's ovulation, the temperature goes up one degree and it stays elevated for the rest of the cycle. So those are two things um, that will change temperature. So your basal rate or your basal temperature, if you want to know the exact measurement, is whatever it is when you first wake up in the morning before you start moving and burning energy for the day. And we all know we can measure temperature in a variety of ways, um, the most common of which uh, throughout your life is probably the oral route. Um, if you take a look at your tongue, there's some nice vascularized beds right underneath uh, the frenulum area that are perfect for holding a thermometer. Uh, there's also these oracle um, thermometers, and probably more commonly, you're, you're familiar with the forehead types of thermometers. Um, and these things are a little bit further away from core temperature, meaning the inside of the body. That's the temperature we're worried about, but they give a really close um, and quick approximation. Um, when you have a patient that is not uh, conscious, you generally have to find another way to take their temperature rather than sticking a thermometer in their mouth. Uh, there's the old school putting the thermometer underneath the armpit. That is one of the least um, accurate when it comes to estimating core temperatures, but it's a really quick, non-invasive way to grab a temperature. And with adults, um, it's a little bit more difficult to do, but definitely possible if they're um, not awake. There's rectal temperature, and this is used a lot also in pediatric populations because it provides such a good estimation of the core or inside of the body temperature. So we really consider out of all of these, uh, the rectal temperature to be the most accurate because we're 
testing from inside of the body closer to the areas we're concerned about getting warm. All right, so as we mentioned, uh, there is an area of the brain that controls these homeostatic baseline measurements of various bodily functions, one of them being body temperature. And this part of the body is known as the hypothalamus. And hypo means below, and thalamus is a part of the brain you can actually see up here. So it is below the thalamus. And the hypothalamus is really this master regulator in the body. It is very similar to the thermostat that you have in a house or building that sets something at baseline, which variations from which can occur. If we take a look at a slice um, image of the actual brain, you'll see that brain tissue looks very homogenous. It's all one color, um, but there are some different areas that can stand out and you can differentiate them from one another. And this area, the POP, that's the pre-optic nucleus. Pre-optic meaning before the optic chiasm, and nucleus referring to a nuclei, so just one, <laughs> nuclei is plural, so a nucleus is singular, and that is referring to a group of cells that all have the same general function. They all do the same general thing. So the preoptic nucleus of the hypothalamus is what sets the resting body temperature. If you know your bodily directions, anterior means towards the front, so this is in the front or anterior portion of the hypothalamus. So the preoptic nucleus is the area of the hypothalamus that sets the resting basal body temperature. All right, so this is just a quick review of homeostasis. So when there is any deviation from homeostasis, the body's job is to go back to its homeostatic set point as quickly and effectively as possible. This, I'm going to use the example of a thermostat, and this one's actually set to what I like in my house. It's 68 degrees. I am in Buffalo, New York, and today it's going to snow, and yesterday when I woke up, it was 16 degrees Fahrenheit, which is super cold to me. So if I have my thermostat set to 68, that's going to be essentially my, you know, my base or baseline or resting temperature. That's our set point. If the cold outside gets too permeating and it starts to decrease the temperature inside of my house, that will be picked up by the thermostat. It notices through its sensors that the temperature is starting to go down. So we have the set point of 68. If the temperature starts to dip and we're moving away from baseline, then this is going to kick the heat on. And the heat will go on until we are back to that baseline 68. It doesn't go on forever. It doesn't just get hotter and hotter in the room. It goes on until we're back to baseline. And that is exactly the way you see things in the body. So if we're looking at some sort of receptor system, so in not a thermostat in this case, it might be our you know, hypothalamus or our thermoreceptors out in the body. So the thermoreceptors, like when you feel cold, they are going to signal to the body that it's cold outside. So they're picking up that it's chilly, that there's snow, and they send a message to the integrating center. In this case, it's our hypothalamus, which is going to have to take account that our baseline temperature is off and it's going to have to correct this. So remember the hypothalamus houses the set point. So in this case, it would be the 68 degrees. So again, you start to get cold, that's picked up by the thermoreceptors, which signal to the hypothalamus that the temperature is starting to go down. So the hypothalamus is going to have to signal to other places in the body to get an output through things like the muscles, an effector, 
which will then bring the temperature up. And it does so until there's feedback to the receptor that it's time to shut off. And we call this a negative feedback loop. A negative feedback loop, meaning that there's something that shuts off the loop. So if we think of negative feedback, so like if I got negative feedback about my jokes, um, full disclosure, I would know that's a lie, but if somebody said, um, your jokes are really bad, um, I wish you would stop them, that would be some negative feedback. So my feedback would be bad jokes, sad face, and then I would stop making the jokes. That's a negative feedback. And that would be different than positive feedback where somebody says, oh man, Dr. B, your jokes are so awesome. You're hilarious. That's positive feedback. And rather than turning off my joke center, that will increase my joke center and the frequency of jokes. And that's a positive feedback loop. It's a little bit different. Not many things in the body work on a positive feedback loop. Almost everything is a negative feedback loop, meaning there is a feedback that there's no longer a deviation and it shuts off the response. Okay, so in normal thermoregulation, so this would be our hypothermia, hyperthermia, or just getting too hot and too cold and not meeting those thresholds for a clinical manifestation of something like hypothermia. So again, we've got these peripheral and central thermoreceptors, which are going to sample levels of the blood and let the body know, let the brain know if the temperature of the blood is deviated at all from that 37 degrees Celsius. And remember in homeostasis, it's the body's job to maintain that. The body hates deviation from homeostasis. Essentially, we define pathology as the sum of deviations from homeostasis. Your body loves to be at stable baseline and will do anything it can to go back to that. So we've got our thermo, thermo means temperature, thermoreceptors out peripherally and centrally sampling the temperature of the blood. And if we find that it's not that 37 degrees, so if it's in the Celsius, if it's higher or lower, the hypothalamus, that integrating center will be triggered to turn on and engage in compensatory mechanisms to alter the temperature to go back to that baseline. So some things that are signaled to, we've got the cerebral cortex. Cortex is Latin for bark, like bark covers a tree. And the cerebrum is part of the brain, the outside part of the brain. So the cerebral cortex is the part of the brain that you think with and make decisions with. So you can engage in behavioral responses. So if the temperature is too cold, your behavioral response might be to put on a sweater or put on some gloves. If you're too hot, it might be to fan yourself or to drink some water or take off a layer. So those are behavioral. Um, you've got your more physiologic types of feedbacks to compensate. Uh, one of the things that definitely alters body temperature is the activity of skeletal muscle. Um, remember, skeletal muscle to contract and then to relax utilizes um, ATP and calcium. And this is a thermogenic reaction in that heat production with ATP drives up the temperature. So when you think of shivering, for example, that is a series of really, really close together and fast contractions of the muscle, which utilizes a lot of energy, which then is going to drive up the body temperature. So you only shiver when you're cold. And again, being cold is a deviation from homeostasis. It's not that 37 degrees Fahrenheit. This also with skeletal muscle, this goes into fanning yourself, which I mentioned before. When you fan yourself and you create, you know, this breeze that goes on your face or body, you feel really nice. And every once in a while, some person will be like, you know, you're making yourself more hot when you do that. 
Well, they're right, even though they kind of stink. And the reason they're right is in order to fan yourself, you are contracting and relaxing skeletal muscle, which we just learned generates uh, heat through its thermogenic uh, properties. So even though it feels good in the short term, um, it does drive heat up over time. Um, one of the things you definitely don't notice is that the hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary, which releases hormones, lots of them. And we learn all about them in the endocrine chapters. But one of those hormones is specifically thermogenic, again, genic genesis creation. Thermo is heat or temperature. So a thermogenic, um, I forgot what I was talking about, hormone is thyroid hormone. Thyroxine is the long name for T4. So we can get a signal from the pituitary to the thyroid to increase its release of T4 out into the bloodstream. T4 increases metabolism all over the body. So it increases that thermogenic rate, that resting basal rate, so that we get more energy production, more energy equals more heat. All right, finally, we have the autonomic compensatory mechanism. So autonomic, that's the part of the body that you don't control. Um, it's, well, you don't control a lot of it, but that's besides the point right now. But you don't notice it because it's the sympathetic and parasympathetic system working in tangent to regulate the body essentially for maintaining at homeostatic levels. So because of sympathetic nerves, this is all going to be sympathetic because when you are in physiologic stress, like an altered basal body temperature, those are sympathetic nerves that go out and innervate the effectors, which will be triggered for their action to maintain homeostasis. So there's sympathetic nerves and sympathetic um, neurotransmitters that signal to the sweat gland so that you start sweating. And sweat is supposed to just be left there, even though it's kind of gross and gets in your eyes, um, because when sweat evaporates, that cools down the body. You only sweat when you're in physiologic stress, when you're too hot, when you're deviated from that 37 degrees Celsius. Otherwise, at basal resting temperature, you shouldn't be sweating. If you are, there's something off homeostatically. The other thing that is really important are the um, tension of the dermal arterioles. Dermal means skin. Oops, I crossed that out. And arterioles literally means little arteries. So these are the vessels that are at the surface of the skin. So that tension will be altered depending on the temperature at the core of the body. And we talk about this more in inflammation as well, but when there is dilation, so when there's dilation of the um, dermal arterioles, there's an engorgement of blood, you turn red, that's called blushing, and that's a heat loss mechanism. The body routes blood flow to the surface of the skin when it wants to lose heat. However, if you're really cold, you might notice when you go outside, you turn pale, eventually the lips turn blue. That's because blood flow is being deviated away from the dermal arterioles. They snap shut, excuse me, essentially, and blood flow is then routed to the deep areas um, that we need to keep alive in the body. So that is a way of maintaining heat. So those dermal arterioles are really important in regulation of heat, and they're also one of the ones you can notice the most by looking at the body um, with this blushing or we call turning white blanching. Okay, so that's normal, normal thermoregulations. Those are the compensatory mechanisms that are triggered by the hypothalamus when there is a deviation from homeostasis. And where this cuts into hyperthermia um, is hyperthermia is being really hot and it's different than a fever because in hyperthermia there is a deviation from homeostasis and it's not on purpose when there is <laughs> this type of deviation the body gets too hot and these compensatory mechanisms 
will kick in to try to move the temperature down. So that's one thing that's really important of a difference between hyperthermia and fever. In hyperthermia, the body wants to cool. It's out of homeostasis and it's trying to cool down. So we define hyperthermia um, it, when core temperatures above 40.5 Celsius or 105 Fahrenheit, which is also when brain swelling occurs, which is an issue. Um, you eventually see that dehydration will start to kick in because as we mentioned, sweating is a compensatory mechanism and there's only so much water in the body. And unfortunately, you'll run out of that water eventually. And when you do, that is called an, and an before something means without. Osis at the end of something means just creation or existence. The, the <laughs> we'll write existence or development of is a better word. Development of. All right. And then hydro is obviously water. So anhydrosis is the absence of water, the absence of sweat. And that's when it really becomes a medical emergency, when somebody runs out of sweat, because that means they've now lost their capacity to cool the body through sweat compensatory mechanisms, and then the body can overheat um, more quickly and more seriously. Just very quickly in hyperthermia, there's two general types that we'll talk about in this class. One is called classic hyperthermia, and it's usually referred to as environmental, which generally just means it's too hot and you're not dehydrated enough. It's too hot outside and there's inadequate hydration. So being outside when it's really warm and not bringing enough water, you can get really hot in when the temperature goes up to 40 and a half Celsius, we would consider that classic hyperthermia. And that's a little bit different than exertional heat stroke. That's not just being outside where it's too hot. That is actively exerting the body. Um, so like in a sport, for example, at spring training, you see a lot of heat stroke complications. So somebody is hot um, in sports, they're usually wearing equipment, which is occlusive and prevents um, adequate sweating and then cooling. And then there is not enough sweating to cool the body down because of, again, either inadequate hydration or constrictive clothing that is making the body more hot. So if remember from um, just your terminology, uncompensated means that the body can't make up for that change. So you can get uncompensated hyperhidrosis, meaning that the sweating is not affecting um, or not effectively cooling the body. It's not affecting the core temperature. Okay, and then really the opposite of that is hypothermia or very low temperature of the bloodstream. So that's when you see core temperatures below about 35 degrees Celsius. Um, there is both mild and severe. The short note about mild is that it's usually uh, not fatal. It's easier to warm somebody up when they have mild hypothermia. They shiver, which is a compensatory mechanism. Um, eventually, you can shiver so much uh, because there's so much ATP being utilized. You need to have um, ATP for the cross bridges to detach during that sliding filament muscle contraction theory. So if those are all utilized or there's too many muscles at once utilizing the ones in the area and the calcium in the area, the muscles will start to lock and cramp because they're unable to relax from that cross bridge. Um, in mild hypothermia, the body engages in heat-preserving mechanisms, and it is treated that way, too. So you see here this little hypothermia burrito, where heat is applied at these areas where there are rich vascular supplies. So it's more likely that heat sources will reach the bloodstream. Any wet clothes should be taken off that individual, and they should be wrapped up in a warm blanket. I say wet because you see mild hypothermia when people fall into water that is very cold. 
Because of that cramping, one of the only times that you'll see mild hypothermia being deadly is when somebody falls into water, the muscles cramp, they can't swim, and then they effectively drown. All right, then there's severe hypothermia. That's when temperatures get below 32 degrees Celsius or 90 Fahrenheit. When somebody's this cold, they lose consciousness rather quickly. Um, so you see like stage, um, like once we get to stage two and three, we have impaired consciousness and then eventually um, they lose their ability to shiver. If somebody is um, already intubated, the most accurate way to check the temperature for them is in the lower third of their esophagus. Only if they're intubated, you don't want to do that normally. But if their airway is already open, checking right there is really close to what the temperature would be in the heart. We want the heart to work. We want it to access calcium. So getting an approximation of cardiac temperature is a really good thing in approximating um their general temperature and how to treat them. Over time, if this is not treated, um, shivering becomes less effective and then eventually stops because of the lack of oxygen coming in. Um, so as respiratory rate goes down, there's less oxygen in, less ability to generate than ATP biochemically. And then without ATP, again, those cross bridges can't detach. So we end up with muscle contraction um, rather than shivering. So eventually you're going to have alterations to the pulse, the blood pressure. And when people get this cold, it's similar to taking a hallucinogenic compound. They act very oddly. It's, um, it's behavior you wouldn't expect. It's almost as if they are intoxicated in some way. Um, but they feel, they report feeling euphoric. They're definitely confused and you will uh, definitely observe odd behavior from them. And that's characteristic of these really severe low tempers. All right. So then finally, this is different than fever because fever, fever is when the body on purpose decides to raise the basal temperature. So rather than there being a set temperature by the hypothalamus, instead of having this 30 degrees Celsius, and any time we deviate from it, the body engages in compensatory mechanisms, a fever resets the homeostatic set point to a higher point to ease in the removal of the pathogen and then the illness. Fever happens, here's your keyword, because of pyrogen release. Pyrogens are things that, again, we'll learn about more during inflammation, but they are compounds that are created during the inflammatory response. And inflammation can be triggered due to trauma, due to ischemic, which means no blood flow, thus no oxygen injury, and infection. Um, those things, again, infection, injury, can trigger the inflammatory cascade. And one of the downstream effects of inflammation is the creation of this substance called pyrogen. Pyrogen is a substance that physically binds to a site in the hypothalamus and helps to change the basal body temperature. So when endogenous pyrogens bind to the hypothalamus, to receptors there, that changes the basal temperature. So instead of you being 98 degrees Fahrenheit, it might change your set point to, um, let's see, like 102. Your body doesn't try everything it can to drive that temperature down. Instead, it wants you to maintain that high temperature. And that's what we call a fever. So the key with the fever is that it involves the release and then binding of these endogenous pyrogen substances in the hypothalamus, and then a physical change to the set point, to the set temperature. Other things you'll see in fever, you'll get release of glucocorticoids like cortisol, for example, for energy conservation, because you're not supposed to be moving around a ton. Your body wants you to sit and rest. A decrease in ADH, so anti-diuretic hormone, when ADH is released, um, 
So antidiuretic means anti-water loss. So if somebody's on a diuretic, that's a diuretic, they have watery urine. So ADH leads to really dark concentrated urine. Um, so a decrease in ADH is like going back to the beginning with a diuretic. So that's going to be a less concentrated urine. Um, yes, that's all I have to say about that right now. Okay, blood flow directed to the core, which we already learned is a heat conserving mechanism. Um, heart rate and blood pressure go up. It's actually a little bit negligible, the amount to which they increase on a clinical scale, but it's enough to alter the thermogenic rate associated with that increased workload. Decreased sweat production. We know sweat is a cooling mechanism. The body doesn't want to cool, so it makes less sweat. Warmth seeking, one of the behavioral things that happens when you have fever, so you feel cold because the blood flow is directed to the core, so your extremities are cold. So you want to just lie underneath a blanket or burrito yourself up. That's called warmth seeking. And general malaise, malaise is a great word, which means a general feeling of being unwell. So not only do you want to put yourself in a blanket, you just want to sit there. So the body will do everything possible to keep you from fighting that temperature. It wants you to stay at that high set point so that it can be better at fighting off infections. Okay, so this is what I just went over. Um, we have this really just broken down. We've got our peripheral thermoreceptors, our hypothalamus. We've got endogenous pyrogen. That's what EP is, binding to the vagus nerve and then binding in the hypothalamus. We have these endogenous pyrogens eventually changing the hypothalamic set point and telling the central nervous center centers to maintain that temperature and to suppress these typical compensatory mechanism of heat loss or heat conservation. All right, so when somebody has a fever, ideally you would just let it be. Um, however, if you've ever had a fever, it is aversive. You don't feel very well. You feel usually very sick. So the inclination of individuals is to generally take some sort of medication to lower the fever. Unfortunately, when you lower a fever, um, the whole point your body wants a high temperature is at a high temperature, bacterial production is decreased, bacteria, and also those specialized white blood cells, like phagocytic cells, for example, they work more effectively. So a high temperature that you would see in a fever is your body's way of maximizing its efficiency in fighting a cold. All right. Then in treatment of fevers, um, you'll see then, because this can start in the inflammatory cascade, um, you would want to block those inflammatory um, sequelas. Sorry, that was a big word. Those <laughs> downstream effects of inflammation. Um, we'll learn the difference of these things later, but NSAIDs are your non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Those include things like Motrin, Aleve, um, Advil, and those uh, are going to get rid of pain. They're anti-inflammatory. They're also anticoagulant, which doesn't really matter here, but they are. Um, and they're antipyretic, so they block that pyrogen um, binding. So they're going to prevent a fever or lower a fever. Um, they're also analgesic, and means, again, without, and gesia is pain relief, so or pain, sorry. So analgesia means without pain, and antipyresis means against pyrogen. So they relieve pain and they block a fever. Acetaminophen is Tylenol, and acetaminophen is a little bit different than an NSAID because it's not anticoagulant, um, and it has really nothing to do with the inflammatory response, but it is something that provides pain relief, so it's analgesic, and it's antipyretic. Tylenol is typically much, much easier on the stomach, so it's generally the first choice, especially in 
pediatric or geriatric populations or anyone with a history of ulcers, heartburn, things of that nature. Other ways you can lower body temperature, ice bath, just what it sounds like, fill a bathtub with ice, get in, body temperature will go down. Lots of people do this for recovery too in exercise. I am not one of them. I have one life to live and I'm not going to spend it in an ice bath. Thank you very much. There's other things I can torture myself with. Another nice thing that you've probably seen in movies or maybe in your own life is applying cooling devices to the forehead. This is a really soothing way to bring down the temperature and also that's where your brain is. Remember I said brain swelling starts at about 105? So that's a nice way to make sure you're taking care of any danger of cerebral swelling or at least showing that you care about that. We'll talk about this more later, but salicylate, that's your aspirin, so that's your NSAID. So NSAID or Tylenol, um, we'll talk about this more later, but prostaglandins are pro-inflammatory hormones. Through this cascade, we get a depression of that set point by inhibiting pyrogen production, inhibit pyrogen production, and then pyrogen binding as a result of that. And then without pyrogen to bind to the vagus and the hypothalamus, the set point isn't going to be elevated and then the temperature can return down to its homeostatic levels. And that's how anti-inflammatories work. Okay, very quickly, infants and children. Um, infants and small kids especially, they're very susceptible to the damage due to fevers. And Physicians tend to take fevers in kids pretty seriously. And the, one of the main reasons for that is their brains are still developing, which means if there's any damage to the brain, that can be long lasting. There is something that can occur. It's called a febrile seizure, which means um, a seizure due to a very high fever. And usually the rule of thumb is like, you're fine. People have them. Don't worry about them. However, when you look at the data of people with active epilepsy and the number of them who experience febrile seizures as children and infants, there's a pretty high correlation to that. And the problem being that the skull is only so big, so if the brain swells too much, it will become damaged in areas. And the way seizures work is that they originate from a damaged area of brain and then cause activity. And um, later on, you can get this piece removed. It's pretty serious. We talk about that in um, later classes. But just know that it is pretty serious. So we try to keep temperatures um, controlled, especially in young kids. Here's my friend's little daughter, and she's got this little fun sticker on her head to check her forehead temperature. These are not accurate at all. Um, they're about two degrees off generally, but they're super fun. They look super cute, and it lets you know what the general um, idea of the temperature is. So you, you can decide whether or not you need a more accurate reading. But um, in kids, brain swelling starts at a little bit lower. But remember, 105 is always like danger zone. And kids, like everyone is different, and your physician uh, mentors would tell you different things too. But 103 for kids neurologically is when you start to get concerned. Okay, so I'm going to let, let you read this sample, sample and question, question on, on your, your own. own. Feel, Feel free, free to leave a comment below the video with your thoughts on answers or any questions that you have about this. All right. Thank you, everyone.